And we both sit in awkward silence. <laughs> Deathly Paul has fallen over the big uh, conversations. <laughs> I was waiting for you to have a uh, opening on that. And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> to a completely borked edition of the Monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, Com coming to us coming to us all the way from his particular hermitage, and the developer of the er of the early access project known as Vigilant, the man better known as Eric. How are you doing tonight, man? Oh, I am medicated to the gills. <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> Reality is watery. It's all good. Well. Yeah. Oh. Um, it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, I'd like you to walk me through your, um, through your, through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. I, I remember, remember my first gaming experience, uh, very clearly, I was seven at the time, so 32 years ago. Uh, and my uncle Lee was, uh, babysitting me. And his friends were over there for, like, the uh, finale of their D&D campaign. And they just had me take over an NPC that was with them and played throughout the night. Like, had a lot of fun. I really had no idea what was going on. But I got to stab things with a sword and cast spells. Pretty awesome. That thing's in. Uh, so I was excited when they were like, hey, we're going to start a new game. Do you want to start Do you want to start with us from the beginning? I was like, yeah. And then we went to uh, not D&D. &D. My first real campaign experience was not D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. It was uh, the old TSR Marvel superheroes, the phase rip system. Ah. And uh, we just did the Secret Wars. Mm -hmm. And I got to play as Spider-Man, which, you know, you're a seven-year-old kid who reads comic books. Like, that is that is the best. Mm -hmm. but it's like, and that spurred of years upon years of collecting and playing and then mostly running because I'm a perma DM and I've been mostly a DM since I was uh, 17, 18. Uh, and I have, I collect RPGs. I have played a lot of RPGs and I still have a lot more I want to play. It's all crazy. And now I'm making my own games. It's just going to be additional games I have to run. <laughs> just, like I've just, I just cemented myself into being a perma DM. Like I'm just, I'm just here. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to say that I that I will that I am cursed to be in the forever GM. But even before I even before I started GMing, um, I w I was in positions where I'd be in I'd be in clubs and it was so disorganized that I that I ju that I just um took that I just took over to try to try and get some measure of order and it ju and it just happened. So it's not a it's not a DMing exclusive phenomenon. I, I am an agent of chaos <laughs> when it comes to organizing things. I care about it. Like, but it's because I'm the kind of guy who, like, midway through something, be like, this idea sucks. Let's do something different. Yeah. Is... So... Well, there, Go ahead. Well, there, well, there was one, there has been at least one time where I've been nicknamed Bullhorn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, my, my players, uh, my players are just waiting because they know they, they can kind of sense when I do that shift now because they know that it's about to go into like weird fantasy or body horror at some point. Mm -hmm. That no way. Um, which cause... I'd say I'd say that's as, I'd say that's as good of a transition spot as any to talk about vigilant and what inspired it. You've you've mentioned that one of the big inspirations was Bloodborne. Oh, absolutely. Um, Bloodborne is like my favorite video game of all time. I just love every aspect of it, except the camera. The camera can eat a dick. Uh, just trying to fight an aberrant beast in a, in a labyrinth with that uh, camera is just, why would you do this to me, game? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, which is was Bloodborne your first your first foray into Miyazaki's work, or or had you been familiar with some of his other games? 
Uh, no, I played uh, Demon Souls and Dark Souls. I'm actually not a huge fan of Dark Souls, any of the games, really. Um, two more than the others. Two is just... It's a pretty game. Yeah, the writing. Just go up to the Emerald... What was it? Emerald something? I don't know. But then she just tells you the whole story of the game right there at the beginning as a prophecy. And it's like, I can... Why are you doing this? <laughs> Please two, stop. It, two has a complicated history, and... There were a lot. There was a lot of. There were a lot of. Pro, there were a lot of problems behind the scenes. Yeah, I mean, their A team is currently working on Bloodborne. So. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but yeah, A team working on Bloodborne, but but um, a, but, but FromSoft still wanted a Dark Souls sequel. So, well, they got one. And then, yeah. for, fortunately, after that, the A team came back for um, for Bloodborne. Not for Bloodborne, for, for Dark Souls three, and I don't think they've done that whole split into an A team or B team since. Yeah, uh, like I said, but it's like I just didn't get into the way Dark Souls played in particularly. It felt a little clunky, and there were a lot of artificial spikes of uh, hardness by just kind of. Mm -hmm. Uh, with early the early access edition, I've gone back and it's starting to turn into more of my own thing. Uh, the alpha edition, which I'm currently working on, is uh, much is, is much more polished, uh, and it's it is very much my own thing at this point. I've kind of gone into a World War One industrial age with things and pulling on uh, pulling on something like the science fiction around uh war and advancing science and um, are you are you when when you mentioned world when you mentioned that what immediately came to mind is something a bit more diesel punk yeah and and uh yeah a little bit and a lot of the parts you know kind of style i'm using as inspiration for it yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of diesel punk there's you know vehicles or whole war front the war front isn't the focus of the game at the moment uh, once I get to like, the full release, I intend on having the, the uh, front line as a fleshed out place you can go. Mm -hmm. You can go now. <laughs> Run my game however you want. Yeah, I don't care. Uh, oh, yeah. But now, yeah, so it's like, oh, go ahead. Uh, as, I as I understand it, the.
<laughs> to give you a how that's working out for me. <laughs> Yay, I it's either long COVID or I might have a brain tumor. That's I wish that was a joke, actually. <laughs> but that's not. That is kind of what's going on there. Yeah, um, but that that's that's something I'd rather that I'd rather I'd rather not go too go too far into that. Um It's just kind of an example of how things work on my end of Yeah. Of things. Oh, uh, I do find it. I I know it's part of Coltrop Core. I know it's part of Coltrop Core, hence the name. But I do find it amusing that you're using D fours. Um, <laughs> like let's, let's just do something different. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I just I was just kind of like. I, I just like it as a uh, way of kind of advertising to work. Because mm -hmm. the other people in the jam will generally look at what you have. Oh, yeah. uh, like, I'm, I'm in another jam with Vigilant right now that is uh, that was in response to them announcing uh, Dark Souls uh, for 5e. Yeah, which I... Um, <laughs> That's such a I, I already, bad I already, cov I already covered um, one of the blog posts that they had on that, and I, um, I have some, I have some quest I have some very... Pointed questions regarding regarding some of their choices. Um, chief chief among them is that is the reason for them doing that position system. That's supposed to be a fusion of of health and stamina. And yeah, see, I haven't actually read what they're doing. With it yeah, yet. I I um I did it. I did a discussion video with good with Good Brothers Anatrix on my on my channel a few days ago about it. Um, the reason why they said that they were going to do that is that introducing a stamina system would be too, would be too much bookkeeping, which I find questionable considering considering the secondary um, resource resource pool that several D and D classes already have, especially classes like sorcerers and monks, two of the more popular classes. Yeah. Yeah, but like stamina would be easy enough, to be easy enough to track. Yeah, and I I distinctly remember I distinctly remember seeing several seeing several um Pathfinder classes with stamina pools. There's of course I'd say I'd say me I'd say measuring stamina would be a hell of a lot easier than measuring um than measuring fancy and spells. Generally, yes. But if I'm if I'm not mis now, maybe you just di maybe you just didn't put it in quite yet but in a later version do you plan on, do you plan on um setting up um playbooks for players or are you go or are you going with something a little more freeform it's it's going to be a little more freeform i'm i'm kind of letting people build their characters like you would if you were actually you know, you know going into blood mm -hmm. uh though i am taking some some aspects from different playbook styles like uh your origin, which, you know, who you are before uh, you started, before you became vigilant, before you became a hunter for the church. Uh, your covenant, which is your, you know, in Bloodborne speak, your your workshop, what kind of hunter are you? Mm -hmm. And each of those also has options for, like, look and clothing style and everything. There's uh, troubles to be picked for each. There's tricks, which are... Uh, or like the uh, advancement moves that you can get in various PBTA games, like mm. uh, Cult Divinity Lost has a just whole metric ass look at them. Um, and it's so the whole thing is I want each person to be able to make their own unique character. There's going to end up being like nine to ten origins. I'm not sure exactly mm -hmm. the final number of that one's going to be, but with Covenants, I think I've got twelve or thirteen. Uh, only three are currently in the early access. I'm adding an additional three for uh, mm -hmm. the alpha. 
Uh, there can be three magic using ones. Uh, Something I'm a bit curious about how you'd handle it is one one of the one of the big um, one of the big claims to fame with Bloodborne has been has been the combination of the trick weapons and firearm setup that you always you always have on in some form. Uh, uh yeah. And when it when it comes to, when it comes to the, when it comes to that, how do you ma how do you manage? How do you manage the mo the motif of tr of um, trick weapons within Vigilant? Um, it's fairly easily actually because I've you know like I said I collect RPGs and I've seen people translate uh, Bloodborne to various other games and saw how they handle things. And, mm -hmm. um, so it's just literally it's an action will switch because your weapon will have a set of traits, you know. You know, serrated or fiery, whatever. You know, the, you know, think of like you know, three five or Pathfinder. You know, they're different like bonus abilities. Just be tags. It's more narrative, but it yeah. does have a purpose. But if it has the you know switch tag, you can just flip it over, and there's a secondary set of uh, traits that now become the uh, primary traits for the weapon. Mm -hmm. It's fairly easy. Uh, ranged weapons, uh, like. They're just items that are instead of traits. Uh, there is already a use of one of my moves for like doing the gun parry, mm -hmm. and that is under, I believe that's under Dance the Razor's Edge, is what the move is called. Uh, and then there is the visceral attack, uh, visceral uh, move, where if you catch a uh, enemy off guard or uh, stunned, you can, uh, as I enthusiastically yell at my. Uh, screen every time I play the game, you can fist the pig. <laughs> That's just unfortunate little suit of things. <laughs> That's there's your there's your first encounter into like you know visceral attacking something giant just mm -hmm. you know, just in a sewer in a Victorian place that has bodies laying everywhere and you're just a giant pig. None of that could smell good. Like just... Yarnum is a horror story on every level. <laughs> It's it is kind it is kind of amusing how well, how well you can get away with horror by not calling yourself a horror game. Yeah, like honestly, Bloodborne it, it did something that I I see attempted so often in fiction, but it very rarely works. Where they promise you one kind of horror, one kind of horror genre, because Bloodborne is like, hey, it's Victorian Gothic horror, you know, werewolves in the streets and like crazy vampire things. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, okay, that's cool. And then you hit that midpoint in the middle of the game, and it's like, ah, sorry, it's actually cosmic uh, horror. Go fight Cthulhu. <laughs> it's like, like, that was a switch, but they do it just perfectly, where it just switches, and it's like, ah. Everything about the game is so well done that I look at, like, how much problems I had just trying to enjoy Dark Souls, and then Bloodborne is like, no, we're perfect. We can do whatever. Although, you will have the tightest mm -hmm. hitboxes ever. Although, given given the whole when you mentioned um, when you mentioned trick um, switching b switching between modes for trick weapons being in action, that leads me to that that brings up one particular thing I'm curious about, because one of the key things that you had to master when it came to trick weapons is being able to is being able to switch in right in the middle of combos. Yeah, bit, I'm. I'm actually working on how to implement that properly, and this is my pen. I have some ideas. I've been running it over because I've been actually I've been doing a lot of talk, going online, Reddit, various other places, talking to them. Going, what would you want from Bloodborne put into tabletop? Mm -hmm. And like they they brought up one idea that I hadn't even thought of, but is definitely now in my rule, which is like, well, it's a very skill based fighter. So when you pick up the you know skill based uh, combat, when you predict the moves, you get used to the moves, and you can take advantage of the moves and bait moves. Mm -hmm. and I was like, I didn't have that in my system yet. It's there now. <laughs> Alpha build, because like, wait a minute, yeah, you're right. Let's reward you and vet. It's like, now you have a reason to actually use those investigate abilities to find out what kind of moves uh, the creature has. It's like, okay. Let's make, the, make these hunters hunters. Yeah. Bit of a random aside, but have you seen the D-make? Yes. <laughs> I've I laughed at it really hard. It looked like an actual PS1 game that I have, uh, Nightmare Creatures. 
well, Nightmare Creatures 2. Nightmare Creatures 1 was bad. Uh, it w- it was ba- it was ba- it was bad depend it was bad on its own it was worse depending on which version you which version you had because of that dumbass adrenaline meter yeah just uh, just give me the second one where you're the axe wielding crazy man that was fine <laughs> the only problem i had with nightmare creatures 2 was at was having to adjust the brightness on my screen yeah yeah it was it was weird on that one but anything that gives me executions i tend to be happy with you know mm-hmm. stealth kill executions yeah, i love I- it that's uh, that shows up in the way I phrase the visceral attack uh, in Bloodborne because, you know, in actual Bloodborne, you have to get a power attack off on their back and get them ready for the visceral attack. And I'm like, no, you catch somebody off guard, tent you their ass. I don't care. <laughs> have you fun. have no idea how much I appreciate that some that somebody else besides besides my brothers are familiar is familiar with Tenchu. Oh, the Tenchu games are amazing. Oh, if there okay, were... well, the first like two or three were amazing, and then then there was that weird last one i don't z i'm not even i'm not even sure if the same staff was even involved with it and i look at that like this weird ass fever dream yeah it felt just felt very off like as far as as far as i'm concerned the only tenchu games that ever came out were the first three yeah because they were amazing uh and i still play those games so good i know i know a lot of people look at splinter cell or hitman as the as the most hardcore of um of stealth games, but I have a soft spot for Tenchu due to the fact that you that all that um first first off your abil- your ability to to detect or be or be detected is far is far less cut and dry. It's all about key it's all about key. Yep. And second at least with at least with something like Hitman or something like Splint or like Splinter Cell you have ra- you have ranged weapons to de- to deal with to deal with folks. I mean, you technically do intense you, but you don't. But um, you don't have much, and you're not and you're gonna be and you're gonna be saving those for when they're absolutely necessary. It's yeah. probably the reason I've seen some people do no item runs, which is ju- is just absolutely nuts. <laughs> Hardcore. No, I I love stealth action games in general, like Dishonored. Mm-hmm. Big fan of Dishonored. Uh, what do you think of What do you think of um, the proper Thief games? Oh, I never actually played them till much later, and so unfortunately, by the time I played the first two, mm-hmm. I uh, they felt kind of clunky to me at the time because I had I went back to them from. So so far after they've been made, which I know is not actually a fault of their own. That's just the difference. Uh, yeah, the fir- the first two are absolute are absolute classics. Um, yeah, i I can understand the I can understand the clunkiness because they were tr- they were trying to make um, melee combat intentionally kind of clunky because you're not because well, Garrett is not a swordsman; he's a thief. Yeah, so it's one of those ones that's like, I can... I, I, I treat Thief like I do a Martin Scorsese film. In that I can see that it's very well done. I can see why people like it, but there's just a disconnect for me. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I'm not going to go out of my way to watch Martin Scorsese, but I'm not going to say he's bad. I will say he's wrong when he's talking about comic book movies, but I won't say he's bad. Yeah. Uh, I think he, when it came to that, I think... I think he I think he's I think he's wrong and right at the same time. It's not something it's not something that's cut and dry. Um I do I I do ha- I do th- I do think that if I'm being honest a bigger a bigger problem they have a bigger problem they have with um co- with comic book movies is what I call death by quippage. This idea, this idea that quip, that um, that doing what that doing one-off quips or be or self-aware winking at the audience is somehow good writing. I mean, it that it just depends on the character, honestly. For me, um, like if it's Deadpool, yeah, sure, we get it. Deadpool's fourth wall breaker, and I love both the Deadpool mm-hmm. movies. By the way, it's just well, Deadpool. Deadpool is a special case, right? He's supposed to do that. Uh, you know, like like the scene from Deadpool where he's like, 
a fourth wall break inside a fourth wall break. It's like 16 walls. It's like it's phenomenal. <laughs> and um, but when other movies do it, it's like uh, the, the only one I gave a pass to on like the Marvel movies for that though was like the Stan Lee cameos because that um, is just kind of a wink and nod to the to the fan base. I'm not I'm not going to say anything bad about those. Yeah, that'd be that'd that'd be. That'd Hold be a like... There's someone at the do- at the door. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, the yeah, I'd I can de- I'm def I'm I definitely appreciate that you're that it seems like you're not you're not using the the tip the typical approach when it comes to um playbooks in Powered by the Apocalypse, largely because that kind of thing. The only way you could possibly do that is to make the is to make the origins from the games into classes in and of themselves, and that creates or the workshops. Depending, like it it would it wouldn't fit the it wouldn't fit the game style. No. I I'm a big fan of what I call layered character creation, which uh, you know, it, like it's take D and D right now. If you split up like the backgrounds with the ancestry and cultures uh, mm-hmm. system which I very much prefer. You know, it's like you have your heritage, culture, your background, which is your actual background, and then you have your class. And it's like each layer adds that layer of uniqueness to the uh, character. And so you're actually doing a lot of bump over the course of it, but everything feels smooth because you're just doing one layer at a time. And by the time you're done, you actually have something functional and different. Yeah. Hopefully, anyway. Um. Now you've been doing a fair amount of play testing with it. What what would you say are some of the things that you've that that um that you thought you thought were good ideas in play testing, but a, but after de- after actually doing the play testing, you're like, nah, that may not be the best move. Uh, the original uh, anime system, <laughs> the original challenges was awful. <laughs> I. Uh... I accidentally made it to where it's basically impossible to beat anything. Um, Because the system was coming up because it had these edges on the hunters in the game. It would remove the highest dive from the roll of the uh, hunters. And you could get multiple debuffs on there. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it was real easy to just empty out uh, players' uh, attack pools. And it was like, oh, this is not okay. Like that, like well, I'm gonna blame three days of no sleep on that one. That's what I'm gonna do. But mm-hmm. kick it out the. Uh, that, that was the big one. Uh, There's like a lot of little adjustments to kind of handle how things work. Uh, the alpha build is actually gonna have a much improved cert, uh, version of the system that I have uh, currently in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm taking effectively blade in the darks clocks. But because I don't want to draw circles on everything, I'm just putting them in like tracks, you know, just like we're used to from video games and various things. And so now there'll be a, a system of these stress tracks for the uh, creatures, and they'll have keywords, much like what is done in a lot of, uh, you know, Powered by the Apocalypse things with monsters and various things, give them different keywords that mean something narratively and mechanically. God, you don't have to have an extra system for them. Just like, hey, this yeah. is what they do. I'm trying. I'm trying uh, to think of of an instance where of an instance where the where a that kind of clock would be utilized. And the big one that I'm thinking of is um, the of other beasts' awareness of you. I.e., you keep scr- you screw around for you screw around for too long, and bigger and bigger beasts are gonna are gonna show up. Yeah. Uh, obvi- yeah, that'd be the kind of thing. Also, they are they're gonna be like the health track for the monsters too, mm-hmm. and because. I don't know how much you've read into Blade in the Darks the way they do the clocks. I've re- I've read a fair bit. Okay. But it's like, there's all sorts of different ways they had of linking the, the clocks and the different stress tracks so that it will have like an actual narrative effect when you fill up uh, one of these. And like some of them will be like, that first track fills up and like, cool, now the monster transforms and the real boss fight starts. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, using them for, you know, like I said, multi-stage there use them for uh, environmental effects that may or may not happen, depending on the, what they do. Yeah, Just a lot of things. There's also going to be stress tracks and 
and trips the uh the moves for the uh, characters that are going to be social and not not necessarily violent in this one mm. uh because i do want like the full range because this is a living city this isn't the yarnum from, you know this isn't yarnum and bloodborne where it's the city is already screwed on that one you you walk into it it is all already done um it's like everybody's gonna die have fun mm-hmm. This is a this is still a living city, a living culture, and so I needed to, yeah. Yes, I, I just want to like contact some couple of those artists and be like, hey, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, they there's a lot of inspiration there because there was one thing in there where they showed uh, like diesel punk World War One style um, monsters that someone had uh, drawn up, and that that clicked hard. Mm-hmm. I actually want to get in touch with uh, either Vati Video or the artist. I don't remember which one has the rights for the art at this particular point uh it's been a while since i watched the video um but they had a version of bloodborne that is all based on these massive lamp boats crossing the sea and there's all sorts of strange aquatic uh monstrosities and uh wax cylinders that play whale songs that uh can uh Mm. change the weather and open up areas and i'm like that is amazing i want that game i Full disclosure, I have a degree in marine biology and I, you know, if everybody's like aquatic monstrosities, I am there. <laughs> just... Well, you've seen, you've seen some of the, you've seen some of the weird ass life that's, that's it, that's in, that's past the, that's past the light barrier in, in oh, yeah. the sea. Like, yeah, once you hit the abyssal of uh, plane. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, there's, there's, well, there's crazy shit in the, uh, that's what, ocean. that's what gave Bioware the inspiration for the Reapers for Mass Effect. It's the Reaper cuttlefish. Yeah. Cuttlefish are awesome. I, I I still want like a race of mantis shrimp out there. <laughs> are you saying that? Be, are you saying that because mantis shri- because um, mantis shrimp are assholes? Uh, I I love them. They are insane. <laughs> They'll bull up on anything. They don't give a shit. It's phenomenal. Uh, I I just I just like the I just like the fact that um as 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 mis- as the true facts guy had had explained. It would probably suck to have a mantis shrimp as a, as a roommate, just because of all the punching. Yeah, <laughs> they back down from nothing. Mm-hmm. Oh, but as outside of their killer thing, uh, though, yeah. I love the fact that their eyes are like the most advanced eyes on Earth, and we have no idea how they see things. Like their eyes are crazy. And we're just like mm-hmm. out of heck. The scientists like, what do they see? No, probably something it doesn't like. <laughs> Yeah, but do you have any idea how little that narrows it down? Exactly. It's definitely that's, not. They're not seeing anything they're afraid of. But that's like that's like that's like a Greek hero approaching Zeus and saying, "You banged my mom." Be like, dude, you will have to narrow that down. <laughs> oh God! But yeah, no. But like that person is like the whale song. Says I even looked into uh, potentially running a campaign of that with my uh, friends, and I found a thing where I could bring whale songs and actually use a, uh, I'd have to look up the site again, use it to give it that old time like wax cylinder sound to use as a prop in the game and it just, it just sounds so cool my friends are not nearly as excited about aquatic adventures as I am sad. Um, I, <laughs> I w- there, there there is one big there is one big reason I would be down for I would be down for something like that if the opportunity presented itself and that is Old old fashioned diving suits, the clo- the closest thing that, the close the a way yes. to get away with power armor without a- without actually being power armor. Oh yeah, the uh, diving bells and everything. Yeah, I'm talking I'm talking I'm those, in- those big yeah. honking diving suits. The the kind the kind that got popularized thanks to Bioshock. Yeah, uh, the, one of the ones on Body Video's uh, art channel had those. And uh, one thing that Body Video put in that I thought was a very nice touch is that when you're going down in the water, 
you're standing like the the bell you're in is the uh like hunter's lantern mm. uh made large and it's like okay that's a nice touch but yeah yeah yeah, on, yeah you give me a game where i can do that and i i'm just gonna have fun subnautica team up with bloodborne you need to do this mm-hmm. oh that would be a terrifying is... game actually <laughs> I mean, there's there's been plenty of t- there's plenty of Subnautica's monsters are what I are what I call or what I call the nope button. Yeah, <laughs> you just see- they they made a wonderful water survival game and an accidental horror game. <laughs> mm-hmm. Especially especially when some of those really big ones come come in and you're just like, nope, nope, not dealing with this. I do not want any of your shit. There's a there's a mod that uh, is being worked on for Subnautica that I want to try, but it's like there's a I don't know how much of Subnautica you've played. Oh, I've I've played my fa- I played my fair amounts. The so, the have um, you gone to that deepest part that has the giant like two mile long skeleton thing? Yeah, there's a mod where a guy is working on putting that into the ocean. I'm like that would be horrifying. Yes, I'll play it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like when it's like when somebody shares a cursed image and you're you're like ah, that's absolutely disgusting. Right click, save target as. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I hate it. Save. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, so as it might seem, mm-hmm. horror is just is kind of my thing. Yeah, uh, I um, I do I do enjoy my fa- I do enjoy my fair share of horror, but um, I think but the kind the kind of horror that I've that I've always been interested in is t- is um taking a new spin on those campfire stories we all to- we all told as kids. Yeah. Oh. Which is effectively it's... creepy pasta at this point. More, more or less, more or less. Um, I'm from Minnesota, and there's a whole lot of things in the forest kind of stories that that I would he- that I would hear all the time. Um, the uh, the folk horror. Yeah, I've long long before a lot of other people were aware of it through pop culture. I was aware on some level of things like skin changes and Wendigos, and which um, I, I am making a D and D Druid Circle based off skin changers and. Uh, I'll be I'll be honest. As a kid, werewolves terrified me far more than vampires. Yeah. See, my problem is like I've never really actually been afraid of horror in general. I I, I was born with a fight reflex, not so much a flee. <laughs> it's just like yeah, why? I'm t- I'm it's like, but I am so a, fascinated watching them. I'm talking about <laughs> at a young age. It's um, the imagination. A young imagination does interesting things when you're surrounded by forest all the time. I mean, yeah, I, I I won't go into the circle, but like thanks to circumstances at home, I was not particularly afraid of uh, most things. Yeah. Uh, without getting into topics that are far too dark for this discussion, yeah. uh, just, uh, but no, it's like I have just like the first horror movie I can remember seeing. Though I probably saw it once before this, because uh, my grandmother picked me up every Friday and I'd spend the weekend with her. Mm-hmm. And first thing we would do is hit Subway in the Blockbuster, and. Uh, Uh, the Hellraiser comic books, along with the like uh, Nightbreed comic books and everything, are very well done for the most part. Mm-hmm. But, but yeah, for the Hellraiser ones, they actually focus on different Cenobites outside of uh, you know Pinhead and the others from the movies. And some of them are some of them are good. Some of them are less so. <laughs> Apparently, Clive Barker hates the, hates um hates the name Pinhead. Yeah, because it's always the leader is always supposed to be the engineer. Um, I've also heard the Hell Priest is a, as a preferred name. Yeah, uh, which is he's referred to often as the uh, comics, uh, which I believe Clyde Barker has much more sway over that. 
other than the movies because like oh the movies have the last one had an archangel in it that was just like a yeah. normal is this, this a bad is this a bad time ahead. to mention that clive barker almost took a swing at roger ebert no that sounds phenomenal actually um barker I, what yeah. barker was a early was a very early adopter when it came to the potential of video games he even wrote a book about it and of course and of course ebert he had he had his whole attitude about about um that was very dismissive regarding what you could do with video games in terms of storytelling and the two of them came to blows frequently about it and if anybody, if anybody is like you can't do good storytelling in a in a video game it's like go play Planescape Torment and come back to me <laughs> um it's important to keep in mind the context this was this was the, this was um this oh yeah, bit, this was way back in the '90s when the, when this whole thing happened. Um, that I think that I think that's why it's unsurprising that he would that he that he would take take the extra step and and work with stu work with studios to make games. And granted, Jericho what Jericho wasn't wasn't very good, but Undying is an underrated classic. Yeah, no, Undying's pretty cool. Uh, uh, but Clyde Barker for full story, is my single favorite living author. Uh, it, two of his books are in my top five of like all time. Mm -hmm. uh, Great and Secret Show, which I will say is is the best book of his that I have read. Like it is, it is a phenomenally written novel. Uh, I think the best. I think the best story when it came to Undying was the uh, was the character was when was the was the story about the main character design. If you're familiar with that one, where he made them call an audible. Um, because I th I think that they had they had originally gone with a more comic book looking character who was Count Magnus who was used who was used in a cameo in the final game. But then Barker showed in and says, "Does anybody know a guy named Magnus? Does anybody know a Count? No. Well, give <laughs> well the make the main character a guy I'd want to sleep with. <laughs> Makes sense with uh, Clyde Barker." Um, mm -hmm. I mean, Magnus, like, you can get away if your game was, like, set in Norway. You know? You could get away with Magnus. Yeah, but it wasn't. Canada. It was set in Ireland. Right. And it's just like, no. Like, come on, guys. <laughs> I'm glad he intervened on that one. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, you, sometimes you need it. Sometimes you need that kind of that kind of mad bastard. But going, for, going forward, um, what do you, what would you, well, what would you have? What would you have um, planned regarding regarding what regarding what you're going to be adjusting for the for the for um, vigilant? I mean, I'm right now. I'm actually fairly happy with where the mechanics are. Obviously, I'm going to smooth them out as thing, as playtesting go versions go. I mean, but they're all actually sitting fairly nicely. The moves are uh, moves are balanced. Uh, things are getting I'm doing more verbiage change actually with uh, the new one so that I'm highlighting different sections, mm -hmm. um, give it a different feel to how things are going, uh, adding in some thematic elements. Like there is the vigilance dream. You know, when the vigilant dies, you go there. To leave the vigilance dream, you have to make an offering of uh, where guild your uh, the blood you've uh, accumulated to the angel in the dream, which is very much a be not afraid kind of angel. Um, and then you crawl out of a grave, uh, close, crawl out of a grave closer to where you want to go. Uh, there's, a, there's a move for it and everything. So if you screw that up, it's like, oh, I just climbed out of a grave in a basement. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. but I just wanted this element of, you know, them coming back and tearing out of a, you know, digging themselves out of the grave just for a nice, uh, horrific imagery, uh, but like I said, it's like going forward, uh, I want I want a fully customizable gear system, you know, with all the different traits and different kind of uh, different kind of things coming in it. Mm -hmm. uh, I am something it's only hinted at so far in uh, what I've written, but there's going to be uh, using the uh, understanding system, the insight system, basically. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a whole set of where the players can spend insight to open up new wards and districts. So that every location, every 
campaign for Vigilant is affected by both GM and player it becomes unique because of the choices made throughout. I want replayability. Mm -hmm. this, it's not a one-hit show. Um, there's going to be like three different kinds of magic for it that are all going to play differently. Mm -hmm. Because when I have multiple kinds of magic, I like it when they feel different than uh, each other. In fact, the alpha build is coming out with uh, the pyromancy. I'm actually working on that a little bit earlier today. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like I just kind of want to get this to a point where I can be like, what would you know, so that I can actually look at everybody else and go, what do you want to do with this? It's like, sure, I've got my setting, but I have other ideas here, and I'm going to tell you how to build them. Oh, yeah. It's like, it's like I just want to go, what do you want to do? And then I want to see. You know, I want to see stories from people playing the game so I can be like, yes, tell me how to fix it. Tell me how to improve it. Tell me how, what you like. Tell me what you did. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's just kind of my goal. I want that Bloodborne feeling. I want that when you fight a guy, that sense of victory. And, you know, also the chance that the players turn into beasts. That's fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, so there's just, I want an evolving, dangerous world. That's what I want for games. Yeah. And I want it to be that way no matter what style you want. It's like you guys want to go to the front lines and deal with ghouls in the trenches and the uh, mishandled creations of the Office of Exceptional Services, which is only hinted at current stuff. But it's basically what happens when the, when the government of the uh, town gets their hands on the kind of the uh, arcane technology of the uh, church. Mm-hmm. That's fun. Uh, but one thing I definitely want to do for this game, and I actually want to do this for all of my games, one of them, is take that Soulborn feel where like everything has just a little bit of lore attached to it. Mm -hmm. You know, the different items, different uh, tricks, troubles, covenants, uh, origins. Yeah, I'd I'd say I'd say if there's anything I'd say if there's anything to rip off when it comes to when it comes to that. It's the way flavor text was written when it came to card games. Because that's what yeah. that feels like an extension of. Yes. I, I absolutely want to uh, get that in there. It's a very cool, uh, very cool tactic. Because mm -hmm. it's like Bloodborne, it's like you can play through the game without reading any of the description of the items, and the game will still make sense. But when you read everything, so much better. Mm -hmm. And so I'm. I'm kind of building that. I'm building in monsters, and, uh, people even. Yeah, I just want to make a living, breathing world and just be like, all right, everything's about to go, you know, down the drain. What do you guys do? Mm -hmm. And I'll, I mean, it's... I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how that de how that develops. Um, but with all of that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. I mean, madness at play is like that—that that, that is my favorite thing. <laughs> and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yeah. I tell that to my players too. Weird. <laughs> oh, great minds think alike, I suppose. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>